So I'm excited to chat with you about TensorFlow today. And as you just heard, machine learning means many different things. It's a huge set of different techniques that have developed at different times. For context, today I'll mostly be focusing on deep learning, which has driven a tremendous set of breakthroughs over the past five years or so, uh, but has deep roots historically. So deep learning is really sort of a modern reincarnation of artificial neural networks uh, that go back decades. And um, you can see sort of a diagram here of a simple convolutional neural network. What's changed over the past five years is really these architectures have gotten a lot bigger. They're trained on a lot more data. There are some new ideas mathematically, but overwhelmingly there's an increase in scale. And so the advantage of deep learning is that you're able to learn features automatically from raw, heterogeneous, noisy data. You don't have to do this explicit feature selection or feature engineering that's typical in, in other machine learning techniques. So here's a stylized animation showing you a, a, a pet classifier <laughs> where you have an image input flowing in the bottom of this network. Certain neurons are activated at every layer. And then at the output, you have these two feeds that read out and say, well, this is actually a dog. Um, but you're not restricted to the image domain. Um, you're not restricted to categorical predictions. In fact, these modern deep neural networks can not only take images as input, they can take audio and predict a sentence. They can take a sentence and predict another sentence, perhaps in another language. They can even take images and read out a sentence, sort of a caption-like description of the image. Um, and the reason I believe this is happening now is that, as I said before, in the past, in some of the earlier incarnations of, say, convolutional neural networks, the computational resources available were much more limited than they are today. So if you see this cartoon curve here, the other machine learning approaches would often do much better with handcrafted features and carefully tuned models that were fitted to this particular domain um, compared to neural networks, except in certain problems like reading uh, amounts on a check or addresses on an envelope. But what's happened is we now have a lot more compute thanks to Moore's law. And so now I think we're roughly here where you see with the red dotted line and these neural networks are suddenly demonstrating all these breakthroughs across a wide variety of domains that were previously unconnected. And so this isn't just about classifying cats and dogs. What does this enable out in the real world? Well, I'll give you just a brief sampling. Um, here's a animation showing you an app that was called WordLens that was acquired by Google and then is now part of Google Translate that's using the camera on device to look at this exit sign, detect the text, detect the language, translate to a different language, and then that's actually swapped into the image here. Um, Google recently rolled out a smart reply feature in Gmail uh, that uh, processes the text of the incoming message and suggests some potential replies. And I was quite shocked to learn that these replies are now up to 10% of all responses sent on mobile. People clicking and saying, yep, that's the reply that I intended. And so that's changing the way that we communicate. Um, Google Photos is an example where you have a photo library with you know, your personal photo collection that you're storing privately on the web. And you're able to automatically search based on the content in those images. Here you're searching for dogs. You can uh, search by identity. Uh, style transfer is another beautiful recent example where you have an input, I believe, photograph, or could be a painting in the upper left. And what you see in these other frames is a different work of art in the lower left used to set a style that's then transferred via these deep neural networks to the input image. And you can see this wild variation in style, but still some underlying aspects of the content are preserved. And so you've seen this in popular apps like Prisma and others. Um, here's a more raw sort of computer vision demo showing you that from street view images, you can detect text in a variety of different languages here that's highlighted, um, even in these large complex images. And this is useful for collecting map data automatically that's eventually going to support autonomous driving. 
There are many approaches to autonomous driving, but from mapping to localization to perception, there's lots of room to apply deep neural networks. So people are taking many different approaches. You can look at overhead imagery and try and analyze where the roofs are and which roofs are appropriate for solar power. Um, you can also take uh, pairs of input images and depth readings and then try to learn to predict the depth, which if you close one eye, you can see, well, I can make an estimate of how far you are away, even if I'm not perfect. And similarly, you can do the same thing with the deep neural network. And of course, that then allows you to make better selfies, which is really the goal of computer science. <laughs> Here you have uh, blurring the background or colorizing only the foreground. But there are more serious applications of this kind of work too. Uh, diabetic retinopathy is one of the leading causes of blindness, especially in other countries. You take these images of the back of the eye and uh, you're looking for these signs of disease. And if you catch this early, you can actually prevent blindness. It's a really profound uh, uh, intervention, but unfortunately there aren't enough trained specialists who are available to do the work and do this early detection and screening, so not everyone has access to this level of care. So researchers have recently shown that you can take these images and train a machine learning model to match the accuracy of your median ophthalmologist. And this is really profound. This kind of work holds the potential at essentially zero marginal cost, other than the scanner, to take this out all over the world. And so as long as you can afford for people to have their eyes scanned, which like the digital cameras we all carry around is gonna be a lot less expensive than seeing a professional ophthalmologist, we might be able to intervene earlier and save people from blindness. Um, we're seeing similar results across pathology, across radiology. So there's this huge range of medical imaging that's currently um, bottlenecked on these very expensive, rare specialists that we think we can radically expand access to care and get people to the right treatment earlier. But outside of the domain of images, uh, I showed you word lens earlier, there's recently been a huge leap forward in machine translation, where you're reading in sentences one, in one language on one side, and then reading out sentences in a different language on the other side. And so the blue bars here, these are the previous handcrafted statistical techniques, and they did reasonably well. The, the orange bar at the top is sort of the accuracy of a human translator. And then that green jump in the middle is the jump from switching to this end-to-end -end neural machine translation. And as you can say, in some cases like uh, French to English, that's actually closing the gap quite substantially towards human level machine translation, which we think will enable better communication all across the world. So just to give you one example here of the previous output from phrase-based machine translation, that last sentence is, whether the leopard had what the demand at that altitude, there is no that nobody explained. It's garbled. You can sort of see the right words, but they're not together in the right way. Whereas the new neural machine translation sentence renders that final sentence as the following. No one can explain what leopard was seeking at that altitude. So a human would have said what the leopard was seeking. But this is a huge qualitative increase in translation accuracy that we think is really profound. But don't stop there. You can also predict properties of molecules, training on simulations, and then predicting outputs 300,000 times faster. So we think there are going to be applications across a lot of hard science of bringing in these deep uh, neural network models. Um, also here we have results in robotics. Uh, let's see if this loads. Where it's much more difficult and expensive to collect training data, but here's this farm of robot arms that are learning to grasp specific objects and pick them up. And by linking perception to movement, you can actually learn behaviors like pushing one object out of the way to grasp another one. So this is in very early stages, but we're excited about it. I guess I have to click here again to get out of this. The robots are taking over. So what tools do we need to produce all these kinds of results? Well, my personal bias is TensorFlow, an open source machine learning platform for everyone. Now, I'd like to caveat, TensorFlow is not restricted to deep neural networks. I've just focused there because those have been some of the most spectacular recent results. But TensorFlow is actually a general purpose um, numerical computation library. So if you have ideas for applying it to some other domain, I'd be happy to chat afterwards to see whether or not it might be appropriate. So 
in all of these cases that I showed you, when you're training machine learning models on vast quantities of data um, and using so much computation, often at the limits of the compute that you can productively wire together, the big challenge is that it often takes weeks to train a state-of-the-art machine learning model to an acceptable level of accuracy. Now, if you're used to programming in a more traditional line-by-line -line paradigm, you know how frustrating it is if compiling your code even takes seconds, much less minutes. So for current machine learning researchers and machine learning engineers, the equivalent of that compilation cycle, which is training the machine learning model, takes weeks. It's terrible. So what we're trying to do with TensorFlow and with some of the hardware acceleration that I'll tell you about a little later is bring that down to minutes or at least hours where you have interactive research, you have instant gratification. Um, even training in a few days is tolerable where you can then fan out and uh, run many experiments in parallel. But once the training cycle is one to four weeks, you'll only do high value experiments, your progress stalls out, and if you have to wait a month, even if theoretically you could wait a month, in reality, those experiments may not even get run. So there's a real qualitative change in the kind of research that you contemplate that's driven by this quantitative change in how fast you can go, how easy it is to express these neural networks, and uh, how quickly they converge. So very quickly, since I know you're hungry for lunch, I'll give you a little more depth about TensorFlow um, and tell you about some exciting new things, an eager mode that we're working on, and also these cloud TPUs and the TensorFlow Research Cloud. So first of all, our goal for TensorFlow is to provide machine learning for everyone, to have an open standard for machine learning that is fast, flexible, and production ready. Now this is challenging from the point of view of system design because these objectives cut against one another. To make something fast, the easiest way to approach it is to cut down on flexibility. If you want it to be production ready, you never want it to change. Whereas again, flexibility, you want to keep up with this amazing progress in the field. And so we're trying to be all things to all people, scaling from research to production. And so you can evaluate for yourself how well things are going. Before TensorFlow, the Google Brain team put together a framework called Disbelief that was pretty good at scaling to production and uh, underlay many of the early results in this recent wave of machine learning, but it wasn't flexible enough. And so TensorFlow was a second generation system that was intended to span this whole spectrum. And it was intended to be open sourced initially. So the exciting thing about TensorFlow is that the version that's used inside Google and the version that's open sourced, they're the same. And they're synced back and forth bi-directionally from GitHub at least once a week and sometimes multiple times a day. So very briefly, fast, flexible, production ready. First, fast. Uh, we recently published some benchmarks, which you can see the link here at the bottom. This is on an image recognition model trained on the ImageNet data set. And what people care about here generally is if you have some of the fastest GPUs that you can pack into a machine, how well do you scale? Uh, how many samples can you process per second across these GPUs? And what you want to see is roughly linear scaling. Often these benchmarks are done with synthetic data where you're not actually training the machine learning model. We think it's important to also show results with real data, as you can see on the right. And there's a slight drop off in performance, but it's not too bad. So within a machine, TensorFlow is scaling very well compared to the ideal, which is that diagonal line. But sometimes you want to go beyond a single machine because again, you're waiting weeks. You want to take that down as far as you can. So here are some results showing TensorFlow scaling all the way up to 64 GPUs. And we're in the process of pushing this further since there have been some very recent results on 128 or even 256 GPUs. So here's one example of TensorFlow being fast. If you ever encounter a problem in which it isn't, please let me know. Uh, we'd love to make it faster. And another thing that's tricky about benchmarks is that it's often difficult to reproduce somebody else's results. And there are all these fine details. How do you pre-process the images? You know, how was your data formatted? Uh, what exact hardware configuration were you using? And so what we think everyone ought to do is open source the code that they use to achieve their benchmarks. And so we're trying to set an example here. If you go to this this uh, URL, you can find the implementations of the benchmarks we use to generate those results. You can try them out yourself. You can see some tips and tricks for building high performance uh, machine learning models in TensorFlow. So let me say a little bit about flexibility. Um, one type of flexibility is being able to run on many different platforms. And so part of the advantage of expressing your machine learning models in TensorFlow is that 
you don't have to invest so much energy into customizing and optimizing your models for each platform. Because TensorFlow does a lot of that work for you. It can uh, run models on CPUs, on state-of-the-art NVIDIA GPUs, also on these tensor processing units that I'm going to tell you about in a minute. But not just on all these service scale platforms, but all the way down to phones, like the iPhone, like Android phones, or even the Raspberry Pi. There's actually quite an active community running TensorFlow models on the Raspberry Pi. TensorFlow also supports many languages. The, the, the most straightforward way to work with it is through Python. But uh, we have great C and C++ and Go and Java bindings and also community contributions in C Sharp and Julia and Rust and Haskell. I think R has been added recently. So um, lots of ways to talk to TensorFlow. And um, I'll tell you a little bit later about the accelerated linear algebra, XLA compiler, and also eager mode. In terms of production readiness, once you've developed a machine learning model, sometimes you want to share it with the world, like I was telling you earlier. Wow, this is a breakthrough. How do we deliver this at scale to millions or even billions of different users? And there are many components that go into that. Some is having great tools available. So there's an open source project called TensorBoard that's associated with TensorFlow that provides a variety of tools. It's sort of like an like a x-ray machine to see into your machine learning models and figure out what's happening during training or when they're running. Here's one of those tools, this embedding visualizer, that takes uh, MNIST, which is the set of handwritten digits, and shows how they've been clustered together by a simple machine learning model. There's TensorFlow Serving, another associated open source project that helps you take a trained model and then serve it at scale and manage versions and, and detect uh, regressions in accuracy over time. And later this year, we'll be coming out with TensorFlow Lite, which is a lightweight version of TensorFlow that's really optimized for these mobile environments, mobile and embedded devices. You have to be very careful about fusing operations together, controlling your memory, reducing your binary size. All that and more will be uh, improved with TensorFlow Lite. So like I said, fast, flexible, production ready. We're excited that both inside Google and across the world, this has seemed to drive a lot of adoption. So here's a chart uh, within Google of projects with model description files for disbelief for TensorFlow. And you can see that internal TensorFlow launch correlation or causation, you be the judge, but there's been incredible uptake after that internal TensorFlow launch. And production use across all of Google's major products as well as use in hundreds of different research projects and papers, most of which are published, many are open source. Um, TensorFlow is now the number one repository in machine learning on GitHub. And the best metric we have, obviously, is GitHub stars. And so if you make a chart over time of people starring the repository on GitHub, that orange curve that's going up and to the right is TensorFlow. Um, so we've been really delighted to see this level of adoption, uh, especially in comparison to other open source machine learning frameworks, some of which have been around much longer. So here are some uh, companies that are using TensorFlow. They don't always tell us what they're using it for. But I know that many of these companies have TensorFlow in production and also supporting a lot of the research that they do. And there are also hundreds more that I couldn't fit on the slide. In terms of community, I think it's important to emphasize TensorFlow is not just developed by Google. We actually have close to 800 contributors outside of Google in over 21,000 commits. And there have actually been major features contributed by external teams, Windows GPU support, some support for InfiniBand, high-performance networking that's landed recently, performance improvements from Intel for their CPUs, you name it. There's been a lot of outside contribution, especially community-created tutorials and models and translations and projects. If you search GitHub for TensorFlow, you currently get over 16,000 hits. Um, one thing the Google team does try to do is engage directly with this community, both on Stack Overflow and on GitHub. We've answered more than 5,000 questions and dealt with more than 5,000 GitHub issues. And if you want to learn more about how the TensorFlow team handles open source support, there's a link here. Pete Warden, who's our lead on mobile, uh, has written up this great piece that goes into a lot more detail there. Uh, we're also really excited about TensorFlow getting incorporated into courses at all levels, you know, from, from high school or even elementary school all the way up through graduate school and beyond. So if you're interested in including TensorFlow in your courses that you teach here, I'd love to talk to you about that. So, what is TensorFlow really? Well, um, very briefly, TensorFlow makes it easy for you to define these data flow graphs that give you a lot of flexibility in specifying your machine learning models. 
And so the graphs are typically defined in this high-level language. Like I said, Python is primary, but there are other al alternatives. Um, and then in a second step, this graph is compiled and optimized, and then you can execute it. And so it's the compilation and optimization part that gives you some of that portability across all these different platforms, including distributed systems. Um, another convenient feature is that uh, TensorFlow can compute these gradients that are so important, especially in these deep neural network models, automatically. And so that saves you from lots of tiny little errors. So people do find it a little bit counterintuitive that when you put a program together like this that you know, says tf.add these two things together, you don't immediately get a result. You've just designed this computation graph. Then later you create a session and you run. So this is the simplest possible example. Obviously, graphs get much more complicated. I'll skip ahead here a little bit. Um, the reason TensorFlow emphasizes these graphs, and as did uh, another open source project called Theano that was very much sort of in the same spirit before it, these neural network models have gotten very large, like you see on the left. I've mentioned the heterogeneous and distributed systems. And so in the early days of neural networks, the diagrams might have looked something like this. Now they look a lot more like this, where each of these boxes actually has a lot of complex internal structure. So it's really convenient for you to have a framework that's managing a lot of these details for you. Um, I've mentioned heterogeneous systems. And so our goal is for TensorFlow to be this sort of universal language for machine learning that manages as much complexity as it can so you can focus on your ideas and on the progress that you want to make. So here's just a quick diagram of the architecture of TensorFlow, this kind of core engine um, that talks to all these different platforms, these different front ends. And then I think it's important to emphasize that we're actually adding higher level APIs on top. So we have layers and estimators. Also, you may have heard of Keras, another popular open source machine learning model. The lead developer of Keras has recently joined the TensorFlow team. And so we're making sure to provide official support for Keras too, to help that community and also provide this high level beautiful way of expressing models to the TensorFlow community. Um, at the top level, we even have these canned estimators, which are models in a box that you can just apply to a particular domain. The nice thing about using these high-level APIs, and we definitely recommend layers and estimators in Keras, is it takes code that would have taken that much space on the left and reduces it to what you see on the right. So I'd like to give you just a whirlwind tour of some exciting new things that are happening. I don't have a ton of time here, so I'd be happy to chat with you afterwards over lunch if you want to learn more. Everything here is subject to change, obviously, because it's under active development. But um, one thing I mentioned is that people sometimes find it confusing that you first have to build a graph before running it. And so we have something under development that we're calling eager mode, which is an imperative way of writing TensorFlow. It's defined by run with control flow in Python, takes away a lot of the boilerplate, like those session.run calls and gives you a lot more flexibility while maintaining this path to get a graph and compile it and scale out on all these different platforms. So just to give you a quick comparison, here's typical TensorFlow, and here's what that same program would look like in eager mode. So typical TensorFlow, eager mode. You can see things get a lot simpler and a lot more Pythonic in this case. Uh, this makes debugging easier in Python. It gives you instant errors and meaningful stack traces. We think this will be great in educational contexts since you get this interactivity. And we still are maintaining compatibility with uh, the estimators and the high performance input pipelines and other things that make TensorFlow great. So to connect to the graph world, um, we have these graph functions. So if you define a function like this in eager mode, you're going to be able to add a decorator at the top, like you can see here. And that decorator will then turn this into a sort of compiled function that can be processed with XLA, pushed down to a TPU, and intermixed with eager mode functions as you continue to prototype. So of course, there's always a cost. There may be a cost in performance here. Um, but we think this path to graphs for the majority, not all, of eager mode code is still going to give people a lot of the, the power and scalability that they want. Session.run goes away. You have more opportunity for structured programming. Anyway, we're really excited about it. Another thing that I'm personally very excited about are these cloud TPUs, or tensor processing units. So Google considered putting custom ASICs in its data centers as early as 2006. But the situation really got urgent in 2013 
when someone computed that if all Android users spoke to their phones for just three minutes a day, that could require Google to double its number of data centers. And that didn't seem feasible, so there was a crash project to develop the first tensor processing unit, or TPU. And uh, that took just 15 months, and these have now been in Google's data centers since 2015. Um, the performance was great, especially compared to contemporary CPUs and GPUs. These TPUs delivered a 15 to 30x speed up with 30 to 80x more power efficiency. And you touch these every day, whether you like it or not. When you run a Google search, your, you know, some of that ranking signal is computed on a uh, first generation TPU. Google Photos that I mentioned earlier, Google Translate, lots of these large scale applications are running inference on these TPUs. The big restriction is that these initial ASICs were designed for inference, not training. And like I mentioned before, we really wanted to bring down that cycle time for training these machine learning models. And these first TPUs didn't touch that problem at all. So at Google I.O. this past year, we announced a second generation TPU. You can see an overhead photo here. And this was designed from the ground up for training and inference. So we're really excited about it. Each one of these devices delivers up to 180 teraflops of floating point performance, which is pretty phenomenal. There are 64 gigabytes of ultra high bandwidth memory. And I'm super excited about the fact that if you need more power than this, which believe it or not, deep learning researchers do, these are designed to be connected together into these pods that you can see here. So each of these pods contains 64 of these second generation TPUs for a total of 11 and a half petaflops, theoretically that you can apply to a single machine learning training problem. So there are terabytes of memory. There's a mesh network connecting these things together. This is a really exciting bespoke supercomputer for the world's largest scale machine learning problems. And the one performance result that we've released so far is on one of our large scale neural machine translation models, it used to take us 24 hours to train the model to a certain accuracy on a cluster of 32 of the best commercially available GPUs. Now we can do that in just six hours on just an eighth of this big TPU pod. So as you might imagine, there's lots more work ongoing. And uh, I hope to have great new benchmarks to share with you soon. Like I said, Sundar announced this in his keynote at Google I.O. And he didn't just reveal this custom hardware for Google's sake. He announced that we're bringing it to cloud as the cloud TPU. So let me give you a sense of what that feels like, because this is what I think is really going to democratize machine learning and make it possible for people in academia who are just independent out in the world to rent a few minutes of slices of these supercomputers and do amazing new things in machine learning. So the simplest possible example here, alpha times x plus y with these numbers, um, you will create a uh, virtual machine just like you currently would on the Google Compute Engine. And then you'll create this new kind of node, this TPU node, and that they'll be automatically connected together in a sort of distributed TensorFlow setting. Then you can SSH into your sort of lead virtual machine and run a session like the following. So here you're in uh, Python importing TensorFlow. What we're going to demonstrate here is actually a low-level API, and so a lot of this is getting cleaned up over time. Like I said, active development, bringing these to cloud. Um, but here, you're opening a session, communicating with your special TPU node. We'll have a simpler way to talk to that in the future. And you're using low-level TensorFlow to place some computation on that TPU. There's your X, there's your Y, there's your A. You're multiplying them together. Then you call session.run, and you get the result that you expect, three threes. So the reason I show you this is not because it's a, a special breakthrough to compute a vector of three threes, but just to show you that this is an interface that's going to let you use extremely high level interactive tools to talk to the most powerful machine learning supercomputers in the world. And that's something I find really exciting. So here's an architectural diagram of these TPUs, your VM on the left communicating over the network with the cloud TPU. And we set it up this way because you know, researchers have a wide variety of problems and needs, and they might want to build much more complicated uh, setups like this, where there might be GPUs involved, there might be simulations and reinforcement learning and multiple TPUs. So I'll just comment briefly on some of the, the lessons that we've learned about end-to-end -end system optimization to really take the full advantage of these supercomputers. So um, here's a diagram like the one before, but I've added XLA the linear algebra compiler in the lower right, and also data sets in the upper left. Um, 
I won't go into XLA in detail, but basically, in order to generate machine code for these TPUs from TensorFlow, we've had to build a whole compiler framework. It's not specialized to the TPU. It's, uh, it's actually able to target CPUs and GPUs and uh, TPUs. And we also encourage external companies that are developing their own ASICs to use XLA to talk to those ASICs. Um, but it's pretty neat. It can do a lot of these optimizations automatically, even across these different platforms, saving you the trouble. Um, we encourage people to use this high-level estimator API to write their code, because if you do, then the code changes to go from GPUs to, say, TPUs, we believe are going to be relatively minimal. You can see here I'm flipping back and forth between, you know, with TPU and without TPU. And uh, you can poke around in tf.contrib.tpu if you want to see where that's going in open source today. And um, I'll just say very briefly, one thing that we've learned is that when these accelerators get 10 times faster, um, that doesn't necessarily improve your whole step time if you're bottlenecked on preprocessing. So we really encourage you to use the new datasets API for much faster data infeed for TensorFlow. This will help you across GPUs and TPUs. So there's the whole picture. There's plenty of pointers here if you want to learn more. And uh, I'll just say one more thing before I um, close. So like I mentioned, you know, TensorFlow, open source, uh, freely available, um, universal sort of language for machine learning for everyone, cloud TPUs coming to the Google Compute Engine as infrastructure and then permeating through the rest of Google Cloud for folks who can use that at uh, all the way up to production scale. But I care a lot about research progress in machine learning, especially research progress in the open. And so I've been driving something called the TensorFlow Research Cloud. I've persuaded Google to set aside 1,000 of these cloud TPUs to accelerate open machine learning research. And so later this year, we're going to begin to open up this cluster of cloud TPUs via an application process um, to help top machine learning researchers create breakthroughs and share them with the world that might not have been possible otherwise. So if you'd like to learn more about this, feel free to chat with me afterwards. Um, we think a lot more compute is going to unlock a lot of innovation. Just one example shown here is where you're actually using machine learning algorithms to generate machine learning architectures. There's kind of this recursive element to it. And I don't have time to go into details, but on the left you see, I think, an alternative to a standard LSTM cell that was generated automatically and performs better in some cases. And then on the right you have an image model with this wild set of interconnections that, again, performs at or beyond the state of the art um, while having been generated completely automatically. So, who knows what's possible once you have 1,000x more compute, and we intend to find out. So if you're interested in uh, learning more, feel free to sign up on the mailing list at g.co slash tpu sign up. And I'd like to just summarize what I've been saying here with this cartoon again. I mentioned that this red dotted line represents sort of where we are today, um, with neural networks just starting to break through above other handcrafted approaches. But where we'd like to go is here. And so with TensorFlow, with cloud TPUs, and with numerous other initiatives, you know, we're hoping together we can push this line forward and create more both product and research breakthroughs like the ones that I've hinted at today. Anyway, thank you very much. I look forward to chatting with you afterwards. Yes, so uh, TensorFlow, while its general purpose is, is most frequently used for these data flow graphs in which tensors are flowing along the edges of the graph. And so I assume that was the inspiration for the name. The tensors are flowing along the edges of the graph. Yes. Uh, yes. So pricing hasn't yet been announced, but you know, our goal is to make this widely available. So, and uh, the TensorFlow Research Cloud is free through an application process. Yes? Can you use other approaches like? So we believe a wide variety of algorithms 
can be implemented in TensorFlow. I don't know if kernel ridge regression is currently included, but you know, support vector machines are. And if you look actually, we have a set of videos on YouTube from the um, TensorFlow Developer Summit that we did in February. And there's a video called the ML Toolkit that mentions several of the sort of more traditional machine learning algorithms that are already available in TensorFlow and Contrib. And uh, if that one's not covered there, which I, I don't think it is, then I'd be happy to connect you to sort of the leader of the ML Toolkit and see if we could add it or take an external contribution to add it. Other questions? All right, well, thank you all very much.